Amen. That was some wonderful singing this morning. I love it when the children are got all together in one place and we sing out and we praise our Lord and Savior. That's, a, that's an awesome sound. That hopefully got you a little bit excited and got your heart and your mind ready to worship uh, our Lord this morning. And, and I think you all understand, you don't worship just in song, but we also worship through His Word and through His message. And so we are going to dive right into God's Word this morning. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want you to get your Bibles out. And I would like you to open to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 and just kind of keep your place there and then flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And in just a few moments I will read those passages for you. But the title of my message this morning is Going Not Knowing. Going not knowing. What we're going to be talking about this morning is the journey of faith in those moments in life where God shows up and He, he surprises you with this set of instructions or this, this one thing that He would like you to do that you look at and say, you know what, there is no possible way that I could ever do what God is asking me to do. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this faith journey, but I wanted to share with you an illustration to help us understand a little bit about this concept of faith faith. Uh, Charles Blondin was a famous French uh, tightrope walker and uh, he really became famous back in 1860 when he showed up over to Niagara Falls and decided to stretch a tightrope from the Canadian side all the way over to the American side and that tightrope stretched some 1100 feet and it stood about 160 feet above the water and that happened in the fall of 1860 specifically September 14th and so the crowds start to gather to watch Charles as he'd walk from one side to the other side and he started out just walking the tightrope like uh, any tightrope walker would and as he got to the other side people started to cheer him on and then he made several passes back and forth over the next several days as the crowds began to gather and get bigger and he started to accomplish uh, bigger and better feats there's one time that he walked across on a pair of stilts and he got to the other side, and the people were cheering and roaring. Pretty soon, the clapping and the cheering was louder than that of the falls. And he took another trip across one time, and he did it blindfolded. And as he got to the other side again, people just erupted in cheers. And there's another time that he went by, or we went across on a bicycle across the Niagara Falls. And so as he's going back and forth, one time he took a chair and cooked an omelet out in the very middle. And, and, and he's, he's just one feet after another. And there's one time that he rolled a wheelbarrow across that tightrope. And he got to the other side, and again, all the cheering was going, and everybody was excited. And he said, how many of you think I could do the same thing with somebody in the wheelbarrow? And everybody's clapping and cheering and said, yeah, we think you can do it. And he goes up to one gentleman, and he says, you think I can do it? And the gentleman says, yes, I think you can do it. He says, good, get it in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> to which he refused to get in the wheelbarrow. And that's a great illustration of our faith, because we'll sit in church on Sunday morning and we all claim yes our God is big and yes we've got a lot of faith and we're excited about who we serve but then God shows up and asks us to do something that maybe is a little bit intimidating and we say not me God that's just asking a little too much I, I believe you're good I'm just not sure if you are that good I shared with many of you yesterday a little bit of my faith journey I said just sit tight I want to share a little bit tomorrow morning well this is that tomorrow morning and, and I want to share with you a little bit of our faith journey when my wife and I were convinced that God was calling us to go into ministry, if you remember my background, I worked in the trades. I had an electrical contracting company. We, we made good money, and we were happy with life. We were content. Uh, we were secure. We were happy. We had a routine, all the things that most people really value. And God says, you know what? I think you ought to be going to Bible school, and you ought to be going into vocational ministry, to which there was a certain point in my life where we both surrendered and said, okay, God, we're in. We will go into the ministry. And then we started making deals with God. And I said, God, if you want me to go to school, I need you to start doing some things for me. And the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to sell my business. And this is right when the economy in Michigan was, was turning, 2008, 2009, right? Not real great years here in Michigan. And I said, Lord, you better sell my business. And not only should you sell my business, but you better sell all the rentals that I have. Because there's no way I can go and leave these things behind. And not only should you sell my business and sell my rentals, but I need you to sell my house also because I can't truck halfway across the country and have these debts, these things that I owe money on hanging over my head. And then I said, you know what? You better provide for me another job because I can't go to Springfield, Missouri without a job. And so we started making all these deals with God. I said, God, we will go into ministry. I'll do what you want me to do if you show up and you do this and you do this and you do this. And my wife and I got severely convicted at this point in our faith journey. We said, you know what? If we can always see the next step, if we always have provision, if we always have things that we can place our trust in, 
then that's not really faith. And we're going to find out today that faith is, is, is something that we can't see. And faith produces results that we're going to talk about in just a few moments. But we said, you know what? If we see that next step, that's not trusting God. That's trusting our own planning. And we said, you know what, this, this isn't faith. And so what we did is we circled a date on the calendar. It was two weeks before this fall semester began over at Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. And I said, Lord, on this day, regardless of whatever else has happened on the home front, back home here, and I grew up in Marysville over by Port Huron on the east side of the state, two hours east. You'll find where we used to live. Even if nothing here happens, we promise you we'll leave on this day. And then we'll head towards Missouri. And so that date came, and we figured, well, two weeks should be enough time. So this date came, and I don't have the exact date with me. You'll have to forgive me. But sure enough, I had everything loaded up. And me and my family and every possession I owned was in a large caravan. I had one of my business vans. I had a cargo trailer. I had my fifth-wheel trailer. I had my big truck. I had a 26-foot Penske. A caravan of trailers going from Marysville, Michigan to Springfield, Missouri. God had not yet sold my house, he had not sold my business, he had not sold our rentals, he had not yet provided a job or even a place to live in Springfield, Missouri. And I'm talking with my wife and we're headed on the way down and she says, what if we've got this wrong? What if somehow we've misgaged what God wants us to do? And, and my response to her was, you know what? If we both firmly believe that this is what God wants, and even if we get there and it's complete failure, you know, we've got to turn around and come home. And somehow or another, this is what God's got planned for our lives. And I could go on for the next two hours to share with you how God began to provide. I won't do that to you. Don't get scared. <laughs> but as we got into Springfield, Missouri, the first thing I did is I showed up to the, to the finance office because I got a bill before I was supposed to get a bill. It's like, I can't pay the bill. What am I supposed to do? And as I'm talking to the lady, she says, have you found a spot to stay yet? I said, no, I just showed up in town and I got a 26-foot Penske and I got a trailer and vans and trucks and everything else and, and we've got nowhere to stay. She said, our church is renting a house. Would you be interested in renting the house? And I tell you what, how God provided time after time. I had to make a double trip because regardless of how much I took with me the first time, it still wasn't enough room to get it all with me. And so I made a return trip back to Michigan, and then I went back to Springfield. And on the way to Springfield, my brother called me and said, you know what, we have a problem over here at work. They want to hire you for six months or six weeks. And that six weeks job turned into years and turned out to be the job I had the entire time I was in Springfield, Missouri. And so I share that story because as we walk through these scriptures with you this morning, I want you to understand this concept of faith. And so if you would, for just a moment, why don't you stand with me? I'm going to read these passages for you. You can follow along with me. But if you would, let's, let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. And it says, By faith Abraham... When called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now flip over to Genesis chapter 12 with me. Here's the passage that wonderfully parallels this passage in Hebrews. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And then skip down just a few verses. We'll pick it up again in verse 4. And so Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to come into your house and sing praises to your name, the privilege that we have, the freedom that we have to open your holy word to read and to teach and to learn. Father, we thank you for for preserving your word for all these thousands of years so that we could get to know you a little better. Lord, as we work through this passage today, I pray through the power of your spirit you'd open our hearts, that you would open our minds, and that, Father, we would submit to whatever it is that you have for us this morning. And through the power of your word, I pray that we would encourage where encouragement is needed. I pray that it would convict where conviction is needed, and God, to provide direction in between. God, we love you. And again, thank you for this time. We just pray that the remaining moments together would honor and glorify your name. We ask it and pray it through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. 
As we talk about this journey of faith, you've got to understand there's two basic ways to live life. The first way that we can live is by sight. And this is by far the very most common thing, and this is the way most of us tend to live. We tend to base our decisions based on what we can see. Tangible evidence, right? We want things that we know are logical. We want things that we know we can reason through and things that um, can, can bring some kind of closure to whatever decisions it is that we need to make. I mean, let's face it, this is how we pick where we're going to go to school, what job uh, we're going to pick, when we're going to quit, when we're going to take another job somewhere else. We base it off the things that we can see and the security that we know can come through those decisions. And so by sight is by far the most popular way to live. And the second way is by faith. And this is far less common, and, and you understand this because we all know how hard it is to live a life strictly by faith because when we live by faith, we're basing it on what? Things we can't see. Things that aren't so tangible. Things that aren't so reasonable. In fact, the average person today does not think that faith is a very practical thing at all because we want direction. We want to know what's going on. I've done a lot of traveling in the past several weeks because I currently live in New Mexico and back and forth to vacation, uh, to Michigan for vacation and back and forth. And, and one thing that we all know is that when we set out for a destination, what, what do we want? We want direction, right? If you're a little bit older, you put your faith in an atlas that shows you where to turn. For you younger people, you have no idea what that is, and that's okay. <laughs> you like the Garmin, right? We, we like the Garmin. We like the global positioning system that, that can tell us you turn here, you turn there. We want hard evidence that can tell us how to get from point A to point B. We want something that is reasonable, something that's logical, something that I can follow to know that I'm going to get from where I'm at to where I want to go. And we often want the same thing in our faith walk, right? We know that God has got us here right now, but we believe that God is leading us this direction in the future. And, and we all say, God, I'll be obedient. You just need to give me the turn by turn because none of us are comfortable setting out on faith and just ending up wherever the road takes us. But that's not how God works. I'm convinced that God has a favorite technique to use with his children. As we walk through this journey that we call faith, and I believe that technique he likes to use is called surprise. Right? Surprise. Because that's, that's when he shows up. He shows up when we don't expect it. And I think of our poor family that, that found out when, we, when I was quitting my business and going into vocational ministry. My in-laws specifically, they, they, they trust me to provide and care for their daughter. And I show up and say, guess what? We're leaving. I'm taking your daughter halfway across the country, and we're going to Springfield, Missouri, where I'm going to go into ministry. Oh, great. Well, where are you going to go? I don't know. Where are you going to live? I don't know. What are you going to do for work? I don't know. Surprise! I'm taking your daughter, I'm taking your family, and we are leaving. Right? And you know what this is like if you've experienced this, but you know something? This is not new. This is not new. Our God is a God of surprise, and we see it all through, all through the Bible. Right? When he very first showed up some 4,500 years ago to Noah, and he said, Noah, here's what I want you to do, okay? This, the world is only evil and wicked continually. I'm going to bring my judgment. Can you picture Noah getting ready to take notes? Okay, God, what do you want me to do? I want you to build a boat. A boat? Lord, do you realize we're in the middle of the desert? Surprise! I want you to build a boat. Well, why do I need a boat? Because it's going to rain. <laughs> do you realize it had never rained up to this point ever? Right? That'd be like God coming up and using some ridiculous word for you and say, this is going to happen sometime in the future, and I want you to be ready for it. No, it's a complete surprise. But Noah did what he was commanded to do. When Joshua was entering into the promised land and, and he had a fortified city, Jericho, standing ahead of him, God shows up to give him some marching orders, doesn't he? And he shows up to Joshua and says, here's what I want you to do on the first day. Okay, picture this again. Joshua getting ready to take some notes. Okay, God, what do you got? I want you to march around the city one time. Okay, march around the city one time. What, what do you want me to do next? Go home. Okay. Day two, what do you want me to do? I want you to march around the city one time. Okay, I got it. Then what? Go home. And I want you to do this for the first six days. And on the seventh day, here's what you're going to do. You're going to march around that city seven times. Okay, now we're getting something. Then what do you want me to do? I want you to scream. You, you want me to do what? Yeah, surprise, right? This is something you didn't expect. I want you to do something that you never thought. And why is he you surprise so much? To prove that he's real. To prove that he's going to show up and do what you thought was seemingly impossible to do. And we see it all through the Bible. Jonah, right? Jonah who decided to be disobedient to the word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was God, I think maybe a lightning bolt would be the most appropriate thing at that moment. If my child was being disobedient, maybe the paddle. I got one of those, and I, I believe in using the paddle. But no, God prepares a big fish to swallow Jonah. 
So that's what you get for being disobedient. Are you ready to listen? Yeah, I'm ready to listen. You see the first amphibious landing in all the scriptures. <laughs> Noah, Jonah shows up and he says, okay, I'm ready to go. And then he decides, you know what, I better do something about this disconnecting relationship and I'm going to send my son. And we would expect, just like all the Jews expected during that time, that he would show up somewhere in the Roman Empire as a great leader. Now, how did Jesus show up as a helpless infant? Okay, he's going to establish his kingdom. No, he's not. He's going to be crucified on a cross. Surprise. You didn't expect it, did you? And then, and then he says, I want you to spread the gospel. I want you to go throughout all the land, and I want you to share the gospel message with every group of people that you come in contact with. Okay, you want Peter to be the main character? You want John to be the main character? No, I'm going to pick Saul. I'm going to pick the biggest persecutor of my name, and I'm going to convert him to be the greatest missionary and church planner to ever walk the planet. Surprise! It's such a big surprise that the disciples at this time, now they're the apostles, were afraid to even talk to Paul. Hey, we remember you. This is how God works, and how long does it take us? How long will it take us to understand? This is what God does. We're surprised all the time, and sometimes I'm kind of surprised at what we're surprised at. I got to come back to, to Michigan several weeks ago to visit with family that we hadn't seen in quite some time because of ministry. And isn't it kind of odd that when we show up, we hadn't seen family in so long that we're surprised the little ones actually grew up? <laughs> Don't you find, wouldn't it be more surprised if you left three years ago, they were this big, and you came back three years later, and they were still that big? That would be the surprise. But, but th this is like what God does. He shows up when we don't expect it. And then we're surprised that he showed up to surprise us. And, and this is the way that he works. This is what he does. And you want to know why it's so hard, this journey of faith? Because it's scary. Because we don't have all the answers. We, we, we explain to somebody what God is doing in our lives, and we're afraid of what they might think. We're afraid of what they might say. We're, we're afraid, and even worse than that, we're afraid that we'll get all that kickback to what God's calling us to do, then we'll go out and try it, and then we might fail. Then our pride gets in the way, and then we've got to show back up to all those people who told you, I knew you shouldn't have done that, and, and, and it's scary. And there's a bottom line I want you to understand as we walk through these passages, okay? I put it up here on the overhead for you, and, and this is a truth that I want you to understand as we go through this passage, and that's this. God's direction never lacks God's protection. If you would, there it is. God's direction never lacks God's protection. I want you to keep this in your forethought as we work through this message because this is the bottom line. This is why most of us never get out to doing what God has called us to do because we're too scared. And we think that we've got to do this thing on our own. And we forget this fact that if God leads us a certain direction, we will always have God's protection. And I want to show you that as we work through these passages that are in front of us here this morning. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 11 again in verse 8. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And that's the title of my message, Not Knowing Where You Are Going. And this is what God shows up to Abraham. And, and Hebrews 11 is a fantastic chapter to read through. When you want to understand faith, because you see how this verse starts, it says, By what? By faith. By faith, and as you work through it, you see it constantly. By faith, by faith, you, we, we quickly begin to understand how important faith is to the Christian walk. By faith, Abraham decided that he was going to be obedient. It says he obeyed, and he went. And now you're thinking at this point, there's something that I'm forgetting, okay? And I'm not. Just with what this verse says right there, it does not mean that there's anything wrong with staying. Okay, as I share my story with you, as I share this passage with you, it's not necessarily about packing your bags and getting ready to travel across the country. But it's a faith journey all the same. There's spiritual application all through these passages. And, and maybe your journey is a little bit more along the lines of service. Maybe it's a, a relationship that needs to be uh, mended and, and, and God is calling you on some other kind of journey. So understand, I'm not saying as I preach at you this morning that everybody needs to pack their bags this afternoon because God's got something else in store for you. Because sometimes God's plan... It's for you to stay put even when you're the one that wants to leave. Okay, some people show up to city, they just can't stand. Now, Charlotte seems like a great place. Charlotte, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been doing so good with that, and then I mess it up. Charlotte seems like a wonderful community, and, and you might be here thinking, you know, I, guess I can't stand it anymore. There's got to be something else, and God might be saying, I want you to stay right where you're at. So as I'm preaching this, don't think that, that I am God's Holy Spirit telling you it's time to go. Okay, there, there's more application to this. But it says, by faith, 
he did what he was supposed to do. And we see some different elements as we work through these verses that uh, is true about Abraham's life. Look at verse 9 with me. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. You know what Abraham understood? Abraham understood that he was a stranger. He understood that he was a pilgrim in a foreign land, in a spot where he doesn't really belong. He's living in a place where he knew this is not permanent. And I love what this says. It says he lived in tents. What does that symbolize? It symbolizes his willingness to get up and go when God calls him. You know how many Christians get to where they think they belong and they just set roots right there. Now, now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is always bad. But they set their roots and say, this is where we belong. This is where my family started. This is where my memories are. This is where my job is at. And I refuse to go anywhere else. So if God even did show up, at this point, you've got a house that's too big, cars that are too nice, too many toys in the garage. And even if God wanted you to call and get you away from where you're at to lead you somewhere else, you'd say, there's no way I can possibly do it. You know, somebody's once said, a Christian ought to live his life with shallow tent pegs. Isn't that a great thought? We ought to live with the willingness to say that wherever God is leading, whenever he leads, I am willing to go. And that's the message. This is what we see, the truth in Abraham's life, what his faith actually looks like. Verse 10, it kind of gives you a little more perspective of where he's going with this thing. It says, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now, he's looking forward. And depending on what translation you read out of, it says that he, he waited. Okay? Now, now, listen. And if you even look up the Greek word, it simply means to wait for. Okay? Abraham waited for. What was Abraham waiting for? Abraham was waiting for something else that had been promised to him. And it tells you exactly what that was. He was waiting for the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. This is where we stumble so often. Because if you're anything like me, waiting is the hardest discipline in the Christian life. That's my opinion. Even when we know God is getting ready to move and take us somewhere else, waiting for me is still the hardest possible thing to do. It's like, okay, God, I got direction. Now I'm ready to go. Let's just let's get this thing moving. And it's so easy to sit there and say, God has forgotten about me. Abraham got to this point at one point in his life, remember? He got tired of waiting for God. And then, see, when you have a problem waiting, you have a problem trusting because God doesn't show up in the time frame that you think he ought to show up in, and then you start taking over. We think that there's something that we can do to help God's grand plan. Isn't that right? I, I kind of think about how this church has been waiting over a year for a pastor. And some of you have been sitting out there saying, this is taking way too long. Let's just get the next guy that we see, and let's bring him in here and get it going. And that would be the easy thing to do. And God might be saying, no, I want you to wait a year, because that's going to be the time you're going to get the guy that I want to leave that church. It's, but see, how, what, see what I'm saying? That's just one illustration, and we could go on, and we could all share times in our lives where we say, you know what, we got tired of waiting for God, and then we got in trouble because we started doing things our way and in our time. Waiting is hard because we also want the blessing. We want the promise before the experience. We, we want what I was talking about. God, you do this, 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 and this, and then I will go and I will be obedient. And we see all throughout the Bible, that's not how our God works. God says, no, you first be obedient, and then I will shower my blessing. I will shower my provision. I will shower my protection, and I will take you and guide you and protect you wherever it is that I lead you. But we get too impatient, and we head out first, and then we get in God's way, and then what do we do? We blame God for the mess that we got ourselves in. That's, that's what we do, and, and it's not just you. It's me, too. It's, it's, this is the way most people live the Christian life, but we need to understand how faith works, and to do that, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This was not uh, in your, but I got it up here on the screen for you, so look at this with me. Hebrews 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now this is the NIV translation, you're familiar with that, but to, to clear up a little bit of explanation time, look at this in the New King James Version with me. It's on the screen for you, okay? It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now I've got a definition of faith that, that I like. It's a simple definition. And faith for me, if you ask me my definition, is, is, is deciding, I, let me say it that way, it's acting Acting as if what God says is really true, even when it doesn't make sense. 
Acting as if what God says is really true, even if it doesn't make sense. And you know, and I like it, there's an action word in there, acting, because what we're going to see is faith is not just a noun. Faith is something that we're meant to practice, something that we're meant to put into motion. Because you look at what this verse is saying right here. It's saying there's a substance, a substance of what we hope for, an evidence about what we do not see. How can there be substance to hope? Right? I mean, this is kind of a profound verse. If you ever spend any amount of time reading and studying over what this verse is saying. Well, if you look these words up in the original language, and, and in the Greek, that word right there, uh, whether it's confidence or substance or whatever translation your word has, it means in the original language to stand under or to support. To stand under or to support. So there's something real here. It's, it, it's, it's foundational. And so we would say, you know what? Faith is to the Christian what a foundation is to a home, right? If you don't have a good foundation on a home, it's not going to stand. It's not going to make it through the storms that come along, the rain. And I don't know if you all get tornadoes around here or not, but, but it doesn't matter because a strong wind, if your home, home is not on a strong foundation, a hard rain, hard wind, strong, anything can blow it right over. And this is what this verse is saying about the Christian life of faith. Faith is the substance, it's the foundation to the Christian life. And it is absolutely, incredibly important to understand faith if you're going to make it through the storms that come along in life. Otherwise, we will get impatient. Otherwise, we will permanently put our roots down to where God can't move us because we think we've got to take care of this thing on our own. But faith is, is the substance of, of what we hope for and assurance or evidence of what we do not see. And evidence, it simply means in the Greek language, a proof. A proof. If you're to get up in a courtroom and to give evidence, you're giving evidence of something that you have seen, something you have heard, something you have witnessed. And so what this verse is saying is this. Faith has got to be something more than a feeling. Faith has got to be something more that you would sit here on Sunday morning and say, I have faith, but never go put it into practice. And what this verse is saying is that when faith is that foundational element in your walk, and as you go forth in faith and you follow what God has for you and for your life or maybe the life of your church or the life of your family or anything else that you walk out in faith, now what's happening is the things you hope for, the things that you can't see, you will now start seeing tangible evidence of that walk with God. Just like on my way to Springfield, Missouri, I went out not seeing what on earth God was doing. And through my faith, God brought the house. He brought the job. He brought the provision for me and for my family. And so this verse is telling us, listen, to understand the Christian life of faith, you better put it into action. Because if all you ever have is a feeling about faith and you can never share any experience, then, then you have not experienced faith in the way that God intended it to be. And we look at that and say, well, is it, is it really that important? Sure it is. Look at Hebrews eleven six 6 with me. And again, if you don't have a Bible, turn there. It's up on the screen. And it says, and without faith, it is what? Impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. How important is faith? If you would sit here this morning and say, is my goal, my desire in life to please my heavenly Father, then faith is foundational. Because if your goal is to please God, this verse makes it very clear that if you do not have faith, it is impossible to please God. And it starts on the very... Uh, foundational level of placing your faith in Jesus Christ, right? If you don't ever establish that relationship, you will never please God. And even as a Christian, if you don't continue to live in faith, you're not going to please God because all you're ever going to do is sit around and do what you want to do. And you will not have that testimony to share with other people. And it's hard, okay? I understand it's hard. And why is this hard? Because we're creatures of habit. And you know this is true. You might look at me and say, you know what? Not me, preacher. You, you, you got me wrong. We are all creatures of habit. I'm a creature of habit. Where do you eat dinner all the time? Right? You probably have a normal restaurant that you go to. You probably have a normal menu item that you order when you get there. It was kind of funny. We went out to dinner with the Drosses the other night, and after Jim ordered, Denise said, I knew he was going to get that. Right? Be because we are creatures of habit. You drive the same kind of cars. Most of us buy into a specific make of car. You go the same direction to work every day. You like routine. You like normal. We like security. We like, we like knowing that we are in control. We are creatures of comfort. Look where you're sitting. Some of you have not been able to pay attention to me up to this point because somebody is sitting where you normally sit. <laughs> right? 
Somebody say, well, you know what I'm saying? You haven't gotten over being upset that your seat has been taken. Why? Because we are creatures of habit. And when you are a creature of habit, it is so hard, so hard to live this life of faith that God is talking about. Why? Because, because we desire our comfort over our desire to please God. And most of the time we do it not even knowing that we are doing it. Now, let's keep my moving on here for, for the sake of time because Genesis 12.1 is a great parallel passage that goes along with Hebrews 6 because, because uh, Hebrews 11, because Hebrews 11 is talking about the life of Abraham. And right here in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, we see where God first shows up to Abraham, okay? And right here, verse 1 with me, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, from your people, and from your father's household to a land that I will show you. Why do I want to show you this? Because it shows us that Abraham was doing life the way he always did life. He was secure. He was happy. He lived with his father. And his father, according to tradition and history, we would say that he was probably a carver of idols. He was an idol worshiper when God all of a sudden showed up in his life and says, Abram, I'm about to turn your life upside down. I know you're safe. I know you're comfortable. I know you're doing life the way you always do life. But listen, it's time to go. In Hebrews chapter 11, shows, tells, and I don't know how on earth God got Abram's attention at this point. Because he's, a, he's a, a worshiper of many different idols. And how God showed up to him, I would love to know this story when I get to heaven. How God showed up and said, Abram, it's time to leave. It's time to leave what is familiar. It's time to leave what is comfortable. It's time to leave your home. It's time to leave your family. It's time to leave your country. And I want you to go. And I can just see him, okay, God, where do you want me to go? I'm willing. No, 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 no. I'm not going to give you that detail yet. I'm not going to give you that detail. You just, you just go to the land that I will show you. In other words, you start the journey, and I'll let you know when you arrive. Wow. Isn't that profound? How many of us have a faith so big to say, you know what? God, I'm convinced you're calling me, and whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whatever we come across, I'm going to put more faith in you than I do in my own abilities, my own reason, my own logic. And listen to me, if you think this is not true, sit down and talk with anybody who's ever had a faith journey. Or just go back through and read all of Hebrews chapter 11. We call that the hall of faith in Christian circles. It's full of stories of men and women who saw God show up and do what they thought was impossible to do. Maybe somebody's come up to you and said, you know what, you ought to be a Bible teacher in the church, a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you ought to do a home group. And your first reaction was, go away, not me. Right? That's too far out of my comfort zone. I, I, I can't do that. Now, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes. You go ahead and throw in any illustration that you want. But all of us have had that experience where we felt God talking to us or maybe speaking to us through somebody else and said, you know what, God? It's not me. That was my argument for a long time. You're listening to somebody who in high school, I would always take a fail on oral book reports because I hated speaking in front of people. Which is why I said, God, I'll never be a pastor. I'll never go into the ministry. And I'll also learn you never tell God what you will and won't do. He'll laugh at you and he'll make you go do what you thought you would never do. But the thing is, I went on faith. And when I got to where he called me to do, he equipped me to do what it was he wanted me to do. And so he tells, tells Abraham, go from your country. Go from everything you're familiar with. And then I want to show you one other element here, and I'll, I'll bring this to a close. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. And it says, so Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham, he was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. I like this part. Abram was how old? 75 years old. Listen, in today's terms, today's standards, he's already retired. He's already drawn a pension. He's already got his home. He's already got all of life figured out. See, a lot of Christians go through life thinking that the surprises are all done, right? We made it through this faith journey. We made it through this surprise. We made it through this. We made it through that. Now it's time for me to sit down and get comfortable because there's no way God is going to call me from where I'm at right now. And I'm looking out across the crowd. I see several of you who are 75 years old, maybe older in some circumstances. And, and listen, and understand, there's nothing wrong with being where you're at if that is where God wants you. But listen, don't sit there and think that God could never call me out and surprise me with anything else again because you might just miss some of the best things that God still has in store for you. You realize that when God puts you here, 
He put you here with his plan and his purpose in mind. And if you woke up this morning sucking air into your lungs with a heartbeat and you walked in here this morning, it means God is not yet through with you. And at any point in your life, he might just show up and say, you know what, my plan for you isn't done yet. And now I want you to go and do this. And maybe for some of you, he wanted you to retire just so you could get involved with this ministry in church or so that you'd have this opportunity to go on this missions trip and be a blessing to this group of people. Who knows what that looks like? I can't tell you what your faith journey is. I, I can't give that to you, but I would caution you to just think that, you know what, just because I've been through one, they're all over for me now. Because you see, if we live our entire lives only by sight, we never know if we are really where God wants us. We never know if we are really truly where we belong. And so let me wind this down for you a little bit here this morning. And I want to remind you of this main point that I shared with you just a few moments ago, and that is simply this, that God's direction never lacks God's protection. Because that is the key element to why we never do what we think God might be calling us to do. Because we can't see the end game, and ultimately we don't trust that God's really got our back. And so if you leave, I don't desire for you to leave this morning with a three-point outline and memorize everything I said. If this is the only point that you get today, that is fine with me. I want you to understand that God's direction never lacks God's protection and understand that if he calls you, whether you're six years old or 80 years old, it doesn't matter. If God has called you to do something, you be obedient because God's direction in your life will never lack his protection to take care of you, to lead you, to do in you whatever needs to be done. And a lot of people make the mistake of going through life thinking, well, as soon as he properly gives me the abilities to do what he wants me to do, then I'll go and do it. You ever see that in the Bible, right? We, we use this argument that I'm not qualified to do what God's told me. I would challenge any person sitting in here this morning to share with me one person in the Bible who's ever qualified to do what God asked him to do. Every great person he ever used started out with, not me, God. Not me, I'm not able, I'm not capable. Moses couldn't speak right, right? I mean, Joshua was not the warrior that he thought he was going to be. We can go through time after time, all the characters in the Bible. God qualifies the people that he calls. And if he's called you to do something, he will give you the ability to do it. And it's hard because it, it, it's hard not going, let me say that, it's hard going not knowing because it's hard giving up what we already have. In fact, they say that's the biggest obstacle to someone coming to faith in God. They think, for me to put my faith in God, then I've got to give up everything that I always thought I deserved, or everything that I earned, or everything that I think is fun. It's the biggest obstacle. And, and there's all kinds of people out there saying, I can't become a Christian because it's no fun. I have to give up my lifestyle of partying. I have to give up my lifestyle of drinking. I have to give up my, my fun times. And all of a sudden, I don't have my weekends anymore because they expect me to be at church on Sunday morning. And they look at the Christian life and think, there's no way that can possibly be fun. And so that thought of having to give up what we already have, that's, that's, that's hard to do. And it's also the biggest obstacle of the faith in the Christian walk. Even after that point in salvation, that Christian walked out of a relationship with God, the biggest hindrance is that inability to be willing to let go of what God's already given us. And on faith, just say, okay, God, I'm letting this go. You know, I love the illustration. Sometimes God gives us things. Several weeks ago, I did a message on God and his gifts, and, and the concept was a gift is never greater than the giver, right? But this is what we do. God gives us gifts, and we hold on to them so tightly. Because we don't want to let them go. And we place more value on that gift than we place on our relationship with God. And then God wants to give you something better, something bigger, something more significant than what he's already given you. And he can't give it to you because your hands are closed and clenched too tightly holding on to what he's already given you. And he's saying, just let it go. Just let it go and trust me as you go through this walk of faith. Now... For point of application this morning, I don't know where you're at on your journey with the Lord. Maybe you woke up this morning and you can relate with Abraham. God is calling you to something. You don't really know what it is, but you've been afraid to take those few little steps of faith because we're just not sure of how it might end. Or maybe it's not quite like Abraham. You've got a little more direction and, and you know what you're supposed to be doing and you've just been too afraid to go out and do it because you don't think you're equipped. You don't think you're qualified. You don't, you don't think you have enough of the big picture to just let go and trust God. And when it comes to an application and a message like this, I can't tell you what it is for you. The one thing I can challenge you with is maybe a couple questions. 
couple questions that you can ask yourself to say, am I really understanding and following where God wants me to go? And one question you might want to ask yourself is, are you where you belong? Are you where you belong? Are you, do you have that peaceful? When I wasn't where I belonged, I woke up every morning with that gut feeling. It's like, you know what? I enjoy what I do. It's just not as fulfilling and satisfying as I think it ought to be. And that's how God started with me. Now, like I said, it might not be moving. It might be whatever it is. Maybe your faith journey is trusting God to go mend a relationship that's been broken in your life. Maybe it's that getting involved in church on this level that we thought, well, there's no way I can possibly do it. However that is for you. But the question is, am I where I belong? Am I doing exactly what God wants me to do? And if I'm not, what am I willing to do about it? And I'd also challenge you uh, with this this morning. If God is speaking to you, don't complicate it. Okay? And some people ask, well, how on earth did you complicate it? I can give you one great example. If you believe God is asking you or calling you to do something, here's what you don't do. Don't go around asking everybody else what they think about it. Okay? Because your family is going to tell you one thing. Your best friend is going to tell you another thing. Your pastor is going to tell you another thing. Unless you will cloud the issue so badly that you will never fully understand what it is God's trying to tell you to do. You think Abraham went around the town and said, hey, God told me to leave. What do you think? You, you, you think this is a good idea? You think it's a bad idea? I can guarantee you. His mommy and daddy would say, no way. You, you stay here. You're part of the family. The neighbor who hates him probably said, yeah, that is God. Get out of here. Go. Right? Listen, if we spend too much time worrying about what everybody else thinks, you will complicate and cloud what it is God's trying to tell you to do. And, and sometimes, listen, don't let the failure thing scare you. Because some of the greatest failures turn, God has turned into some of the greatest blessings. And a lot of people think that when I become a Christian and I start doing what God wants me to do, then everything is going to go okay. Well, that person has never read the book of James. Right? James makes it perfectly clear. Listen, the Christian life, the believer's life, this walk of faith that we're talking about, is not all sunshine and roses. Sometimes you'll go through that difficult time. But if your faith is big enough, you'll understand that that difficult time God is using to mold you and to use you into the tool that he wants you to be. My wife is going through a thing right now that we would sit there and say, well, why on earth is this happening? And I could spend a long time sharing with you what we've seen God doing through it. But, but something that we might look at and say, this is an incredibly big negative. God is going to turn around someday and down the road and he's going to put Mandy in the path of somebody else who's going through something similar and she'll be able to be an encouragement. You know, we believe passages like Romans 8, 28, or we don't. Do all things really work together for good? Do we believe that or don't we believe that? If we believe it, we got to be willing to say good or bad. I trust, and my faith is big enough to understand that whatever it is I'm going through, if I am where God wants me, if I just hang it, if I can wait and not get ahead of God's plan, then this thing is going to turn out the way it's supposed to go. If you would, stand with me. Normally, I'd offer a time of invitation, but for the sake of time, I'm going I'm to let that go this morning, and I'm going to do invitation just a little bit differently. And if you want to play the piano, do what you've got to do, you can, but uh, I want your attention for just a few moments, and what I would like you to do is just bow your heads for a few moments. Bow your heads, close your eyes, and in just a moment, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for this church. I want to pray for God's direction. But I want to pray for you specifically this morning. And so if you're sitting out here this morning and now you're standing, if you're standing out there and you're saying, you know what, God has been working in my life and I have been resisting his call or I've been so clouded, I don't know for sure what it is he wants me to do. But this morning I want to make that commitment to whatever God has asked me to do. I will submit to his will and I would like you to pray for me through the process. If that's you this morning, would you please raise your hand? Okay, I see that hand. I see your hands. Thank you. Anybody else to say, pray for me? I don't know what it is. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I see those hands. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the privilege that I've had this morning to come and open your word and to share your scripture with this people. God, we ask that through the power of your Spirit that this Word would penetrate deeply into our hearts and into our minds. Lord, we open this service in prayer that way, and now we see clearly that your Holy Spirit has been working. We have seen these men and women raise their hands saying, God, I don't know for sure what you're doing in my life, or God, I'm tired of resisting what you're trying to do in my life. But at this very moment, I want to submit to your will. This very moment, I want to exercise a faith greater than anything I've ever tried before. 
God, I pray for that individual at this moment. God, I pray that you'd continue to encourage their heart, that you'd continue to guide and direct them through this journey. Help them to understand this truth that your direction will never lack your protection. Whatever it is, God, that you have called us to do, you will equip us to do it. God, what an awesome promise. And we thank you for Hebrews chapter 11 that gives testimony after testimony of your goodness. And Father, I pray that as we end our time here this morning, we pray for the votes and for the decisions that need to be made. But Father, beyond that, I pray for the decisions that have been made in the hearts. And as we go forth from this place, my prayer is that we would not go back into lunch immediately after church and forget about everything that you just said to us. I pray that we don't go back to work on Monday morning and forget about living and witnessing the way that you have called us to live. God, give us the opportunities. Give us the courage to be the witnesses that you have called us to be. And Father, through this faith journey, I pray that you would continue to strengthen that faith so that whatever comes along in life, we can say it is good because my God is big. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your guidance, for your direction. And Father, I close this meeting now in the name of Jesus. Amen.